AB calculus AB unit three exam corrective. Um, hopefully you've tried this to help yourself get ready for the retest. Um, so I'm going to go through it right now and kind of talk about some things I noticed on the test that people had trouble with. Find the exact value of the slope of BC. So BC is this on here, there's a number of different ways you could find the slope of this, but it is perpendicular to this line. So you could find the slope of this line and then take the negative reciprocal. You could also draw a straight line down and it creates new right triangles. Um, I think this is the way maybe I would do it. I'd say, well, if this is 30 and this is 60, this is 90. This would have to be 30 because they add to 90. This would have to be 60. So you have a 30, 60, 90, short sides one, it, that's not the actual size of but relative to the other ones one root three and two and so you could use this slope slope of bc is rise of run down root three over positive one and the answer is negative root three and you're done so i mean that's I think that's my favorite quick way. Um, like I said, you could find the slope of this one. You could say, well, the slope of AC is root three. Now, for this one, you could do, you could call this side one, two, and root three. Now, these aren't the actual sizes, but relative at least for it, within inside this triangle. So the slope of this one is up one over root three. And so then you could do this slope perpendicular to it is negative root three over one. You get the same answer that we got up here. You could use trig. I mean, you could say, well, uh, tangent of 30 degrees would give you sine over cosine, which would, you know, tangent is opposite over adjacent, which is rise over run. So you could do this. And, uh, you know, that's going to find the slope of AC. Um, so sine of 30 is, that's the smallest angle. So one half over root three and you get one over root three, just like we did right there. You could flip it, but you do tangent 60. Now when you do tangent 60, you're going to have to make it negative. If anything, you should all know that this is going to be a negative slope. It's going down. So some different ideas. Find angle of inclination for this line. So if you imagine this line, uh, this is a line. It has y intercept of two and it has a negative slope. So the angle of inclination uh, could be like, well, it's, you know, this angle here. Uh, or, but I mean, you probably want to say, I mean, if it were going up, we we would say that this is the angle of inclination. So we could say, well, that's the angle of inclination, angle of depression, angle of elevation. Um, it's a little confusing, I guess, <clears throat> wording, but uh, let's see. I'm going to draw maybe a slightly nicer picture look like that was just kind of a rough sketch and so it's going uh it starts at two it's going down root three over one right rise of run this is a slope and so if you do that you say oh there's a little right triangle here one root three well this would have to be two this is a 30 60 90 and uh so you know, this angle right here is 30 degrees. And uh, this angle right here is 300 and, sorry, hold on, 30 degrees. Yeah. This is 30. If that's 30, then this is 60. So this is actually 60 right here. So you can kind of think of it this way, or you could think of it as that angle. Either it's going down 60 degrees, or you kind of say it's gone up 30 degrees. So inclination is usually up. So I'd say 30 degrees. Don't worry too much about this one. That was just kind of a, a weird variation. Uh, gravity problems. 
um, are not going to be on the test and retest, but they will come up again in the future. So we might as well just practice them. Uh, vols height after two seconds, given by that, find the vols max height. So really this one, um, you're given the function, which is based off of gravity. Um, and you want to find the max height. Well, this is the height. You're trying to find max H. So you need endpoints, critical points, make a table. Find the critical points, you got to take the derivative of H. And set it equal to zero or undefined. And then solve. Well, that's never going to be undefined, so it's going to be zero. So you subtract 64, divide by negative 32, and you get two. So this is your critical point. Your endpoints for the gravity problems are going to come from like just realistic kind of times. <clears throat> Time zero is the beginning of the problem. And then when it hits the ground, the ball is being thrown up and then it's landing on the ground. That's when we're going to stop it. So we need to find the time to impact. Time to impact is when the ball reaches the ground, which means its height has to be zero. So we set it equal to zero and we solve. Now, I'm uh, trying to factor this. Uh, I think we take a negative two out of our thing. 8t squared minus 32t minus five. Um, I think that's all I can do. And I don't know if I can factor this. I don't think I can. So I'm going to have to use quadratic formula. So this problem's just getting better and better. Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus four a c all over two a <clears throat> so what's that going to give us 32 32 squared is four six zero six nine four twelve carry the one ten twenty four and this is going to be five times a times five is forty so it's going to be uh 160 so we're going to add 160 to this because a negative times a negative is positive. So we're going to have plus or minus the square root of 1184 <clears throat> over 16. And we can try and simplify this. Uh, we can take a two out for sure. I just try and do what's easiest in my head. 592. Two out of that. Uh, 250, it's almost 600, so it's almost uh, 300. Uh, 296, 148, 74, 37. So pair of twos, pair of twos. So we got 32 plus or minus four square root 74. Over 16, we could, we could simplify this a little bit, divide the 4 out of everything on top and bottom. 8 plus or minus 74 over 4. So there's two answers. <clears throat> there's 8 plus the square root of 74 and 8 minus the square root of 74. Uh, square root of 74 is definitely bigger than 8, right? The square root of 64. So I mean, it's like uh, it's between 64 and 81. Uh, it's a little close to 81, so I, I would estimate it's like you know, 8.6 or 8.7, um, which is going to give us a negative here, negative time we're not going to consider. So this is the time we want for impact. And so, I mean, this just has some good, this has some good practice in it, uh, even if I don't give you a gravity problem to retest for extreme value theorem. So the endpoints are 0, and eight plus square root of 74 over four. Those are your endpoints. And I'm gonna make a table. <clears throat> Excuse me. So zero. Um, the critical point was at two, and then eight plus square root of 74 over four. 
4. So we plug these in here. If I plug 0 in here, I get 10. If we plug 2 in, I get uh, negative 16 times 4, negative 64, plus 128, plus 10, is going to be 74. If you plug this in, you should get 0, because that's, that's how we found it, right? Should get 0. So here's your max. Here's your min. We were looking for the max, but you do the same exact work to find the, uh, the min. So we say the maximum height is 74 you know, feet, even though it doesn't say this is based off feet, uh, at time t equals 2 seconds by extreme value theorem. checking endpoints and critical points. That's the explanation I always want to see. That's called the justification by extreme value theorem, checking endpoints and critical points. Very thorough answer. So um, you, you have to do some of this stuff, even on the non gravity problems. There isn't an optimization problem on this uh, Corrective, so you're gonna have to, you know, go back and do the other ones on homework or in the original test. <clears throat> Sketch and show the asymptotes. Okay, so this is some kind of you know conic section. So we're gonna score both sides. So really, we're just trying to you know graph it. And uh, so it's gonna be y squared equals the two gets squared. Square root goes away. <clears throat> So we get 4x squared minus 16. Now, um, we usually, for most of these conic sections, want to move everything to one side. So it's going to be, uh, I mean, you could do y squared minus 4x squared equals negative 16. But we also want this to become a positive 1. So we're going to divide by negative 16. And so the positive term usually you want, you know, there's a positive negative, which means already it's going to be an ellipse. Um, so... I'm going to put the x squared over 4 first, and then the minus y squared over 16 next equals 1. So this is the first thing you want to do is get this equation into a friendly form. This is an ellipse, so we're going to go square root of what's on the bottom underneath the x squareds. That's how far you're going to go left and right. Put some dots, and then square root of what's below the y squareds up and down. 1, 2, 3, 4. You should label these. With the exact values on your graph. And then you usually, what we usually do is we create a box. Even if it's going to be the ellipse, I would create a box. It makes it easier to draw a nice ellipse. This is a hyperbola though. So next we draw the diagonals. All this is light dashed work. It's not part of the graph. And then you can decide is it up, down, left, or right? Now since the x squareds are positive, it's going to be left or right. Now again, we're still drawing this lightly. Because it's possible it's not going to be the whole graph. On these, the way it's written originally, y equals, if it's positive, that's the top half. If it's negative, it's the bottom half. So we're just dealing with the top half. So that's what we're going to darken in. Arrows should look like it dead ends there. Solid dot goes towards the asymptotes. Doesn't touch them. Doesn't cross them. Doesn't go back away from them. It looks like it's ever getting closer. <laughs> and that's your graph. So... Um, all right, number five, determine the nature of these conics. Like, is it the top or bottom of what kind of shape? So this is really kind of the same kind of work, but without doing all the graphing. So I would uh, try and change it to a friendlier form. Add the 4x squared to the other side. So we have 4x squared plus y squared equals 16. This is not a circle because otherwise you would have to have the same numbers above or below them. So we're going to make that a 1. So it's going to be x squared over 4 plus y squared over 16 equals 1. So this is an ellipse for sure, but it's the bottom of the ellipse because of the original negative. Now, if they just gave it to you like this, it'd be the whole thing. 
if there are positive, if there was no negative in front, it'd be a top, negative move the bottom. So let's try this one. Now this one doesn't have an x squared, so that means it's probably a parabola, right? Um, so, I mean, we could solve for x. If, if the y squared, it means it's like a sideways parabola. So we could get the, uh, the y by itself, the x by itself. Um, 9x equals 36 minus y squared. x equals 4 minus 1 ninth y squared. So this is kind of like standard form of it. So it's a, it's a horizontal parabola, sideways parabola. Okay. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, a rough sketch because the negative is probably facing backwards or something like that. But it's only the top. Because originally there was a positive there. So it's just the top. Okay. Um, function notation. These should be kind of more easy, direct, not hard thinking kind of problems, but it's easy to make little mistakes. So, and you got to simplify your answers. Um, okay, so <clears throat> first thing is make sure you plug in the right function. So if I plug a one into F, wherever I see an X, and I put parentheses around each of these, and then G is going to be natural log of the square root of E. So I just plugged everything into the right function. You really should have these parentheses around all this, though. And some people on the test weren't doing that, which looked weird, even if they got it right. So that's going to be 2 minus 4 is negative 2. You got, you got to do that first. Now, this is the same thing as natural log of E to the 1 half, right? Square root to 1 half power. And there's a lot of different ways to think of this. You can move the 1 half in front. Natural log of E is 1. Or you can just say the natural log and E cancel each other out and get a one half. Um, so you're definitely going to get a one half out of that. Natural log E goes away. So your final answer is negative one. But I don't want natural logs with E's left over inside of them. You could have simplified it. Okay, this one, we're plugging 3K into F. So wherever you see it, put it in parentheses. <clears throat> We see an x and then put parentheses around the whole thing minus parentheses around the whole thing two times k plus two squared minus four times k plus two parentheses around all of that because look this negative that's subtracting this whole thing has to be distributed to everything that comes from that and that was a huge mistake a lot of people made and I <clears throat> I penalized it heavily because we can't make those kind of mistakes anymore. This is going to be 9k squared, so 18k squared minus 12k for that, minus, I'm going to keep the parentheses here and simplify what's inside and then distribute the negative. So this is going to be k squared plus 4k plus 4. So that's going to be 2k squared plus 8k plus 8 minus 4k minus 8. And then we got to distribute this negative to everything. I mean, we could combine like terms 2k squared uh, plus 4k. And then the 8s actually cancel each other out. So I'm just take your time on these. 18k squared minus 12k minus 2k squared minus 4k. Final answer is <clears throat> uh, 16k squared minus 16k just be very careful okay the domain of this function well you should probably write down what that function is first g of uh, g with f in it so that's gonna be natural log of 2x squared minus 4x <clears throat> that's the function g of f of x so the domain is that the inside of the natural log has to be positive. It cannot be equal to zero, cannot be negative. And then you gotta solve this. Now some of you guys just threw everything and they learned in chapter one out. You start doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, this is a line check. This is a polynomial inequality. We did a ton of these in chapter one where we do a line check. So you factor it, you find the zeros and you set up a line. These are gonna be open dots. 
Test a point. Tell me what point you're testing. I like to test far right in polynomial inequalities. Three, uh, positive, positive, true, false, true. <clears throat> Write your answer in interval notation. So the answer is negative infinity to zero and two to positive infinity. So these problems, these domain questions, generally become chapter one problems. Um, so. <clears throat> Okay, let's go to the next page. <clears throat> okay, um, just sketch piecewise graph. Well, kind of what I would do is just graph all of these graphs. Uh, cubic line and a horizontal line. So um, one, two, three, four, five, six, and one, two, three, four, five, six. I'll just start with that. So this one has a slope of one. So we're going up one, over one, up one, over one. So <clears throat> lightly, that's that line. And then there's a horizontal line, y equals 3, which looks like that. And then there's a cubic, <clears throat> which goes through 0, 0, right? And 1, 1, and 2, 8, which kind of works out really nice. Look, it goes right on top of that same point, or negative 1, 1. So this is what this graph looks like. All right, and so um, from 1 to 2... It's the cubic, the open dots. <clears throat> Excuse me. From two to three, it's the line, but it includes two, so that's a solid dot. And then an open dot there, so it includes a line. And then everywhere else, it's this other guy, so that means that three, we got to put a solid dot here because it was an open dot. If that was a solid dot, this would be open dot. These are functions. They shouldn't have more than one output, same input. But then even over here, <clears throat> this is going to be a solid dot because that one's open. We got to give value for x equals one. And there you go. That's your piecewise graph. Okay, number 11 for problem 10, determine the linear replacement for two to three to eliminate the corner at x equals two. So linear replacement, uh, replace it with a different line so that there isn't a corner right there. And so, you know, the line is gonna be y equals mx plus b, some kind of line, right? And uh, there's two conditions that have to happen here. One, they both have to share the point. They both have to have the same y values. So you're, they're going to need to be equal to each other at that place. And it's at x equals 2. So we know that the x value is 2. So we have 2n plus b equals 8. So this is kind of the continuity differentiability issue, right? If two functions are continued, it's continuous differentiable. They have the same y value, so that's the continuity part of it. And then they have to have the same slope to not have a corner. So we got to do the derivatives y equal y prime equals n, y prime equals 3x squared. And the slopes have to be equal at the corner. Now we know that the x value is 2. So m equals 12, right? And then you plug that into here. And you get v equals uh, 8 minus 24 is negative 16. And so now you have what you need to write the equation of the line. y equals mx 12x plus b minus 16. So it's a little different spin on the continuity differentiability issue. Determine a piecewise formula for this, this graph. Okay, This is something a lot of people have some trouble with. Small errors, big errors. 
first of all, you got to realize that this graph ends here. So you got to figure out what that is for, for what X values this works for. You got to find that X intercept. This one keeps going, right? So don't end it over here. Um, if this is 45, now <clears throat> we don't know that this is a right angle. I think maybe the one that says had a right angle, which actually made it a little easier than this one. But if this is 45, and if we draw a line down here, then that would have to be 45. Now I don't know what's going on in here, but this is this would have a, a slope of down. This is like one over one, down one over one. The slope of this is negative one. Okay, just using my knowledge of 45, 45, 90s. Now over here, um, the x value is root three. The y value is three root three. So really, and then now I'm gonna think of this as the height of this is three root three. There's a negative root three over here. So how are we gonna do this? Um, well, I guess we could just do rise of run. I am overthinking this. So on this, on this graph over here, from here to here, these two nice points, it goes up from negative root three to three root three. So it's positive four root three rise over root three run. And so the slope is four. I was like about to try and do a special triangle or something like that. I was gonna make it too hard. So slope of that one's four. That's probably one of the harder things is finding slopes of these. Cause now I would just do piecewise, but I don't want piecewise in my final answer for, for this. Cause this is like Y right here. So having Y and stuff in the middle over here, that should, so you're gonna change the slope intercept. But uh, the first line is Y minus, you could use either one of these points. I think this one's easier. In fact, you could just go directly to slope intercept form for this guy, because you already know the Y intercept. But either way, you do that. So that's one of your lines. That's for that chunk. I mean, you could write it over here if you want for x minus root three, and that's going to be for all x less than root three, or equals to if you want. But you should only do the or equals to for one of one of them at root three. But it should go to the left forever. This one right here, you got to do y minus three root three equals negative one times x minus root three. So point slope form first. <clears throat> then add three root three, so it's gonna be plus four root three. So that's the equation for the second chunk. But where do we define it? Well, it starts at root three, and then it and then it keeps going until this x intercept. So we've got to figure out what that x intercept is. Now, you got to give the root three to one of these guys. It doesn't matter. I mean, you could give it to this one and then don't put it here, or you can put it there and then don't put it here. It shouldn't belong to both, okay? But the y intercept or the x intercept is found back in algebra one for any function, including lines, by setting the y value equal to zero. So then x equals four root three. So we want it to stop at four root three. <laughs> So that's your answer. Okay. All right. Uh, Thirteen. Find asymptotes for these graphs. So you had a big, a big grid of problems where twenty of a hundred points on your test that a lot of people had to struggle on. And I would draw sketches of all of them. Find concave up or down, increasing, decreasing, or asymptotes. So we could do all that real quick right here, even though it's only asking for asymptotes. But really, you should graph this. So. What does a log graph look like? Well, if you're having trouble remembering log graphs, they come from exponentials, right? And then they get flipped over y equals x. So their horizontal asymptotes become vertical asymptotes. Their y-intercept becomes an x-intercept. And it looks like this. The minus two moves it to the right two units. <clears throat> So now uh, the x-intercept is at three zero, which is something important to label on your graphs. If I do ask for a graph, the asymptote is y equals two, something also that you should label on your graph. And it looks like this. 
So that's what I would do because now the answer, anything about this is easy. The, the asymptote is y equals two. We could also include that it is increasing. We could also say that it is concave down. So the, the work I just did satisfies lots of different questions. Or if I just asked for the graph, that's what you would need. Okay, the next one uh, is an exponential. So we just start with the parent function of an exponential, generically, looks like that. Has a y intercept of 0, 1, has a horizontal asymptote of y equals 0 to begin with. Then work from the inside out. So the minus 2 on the inside moves everything to the right 2. So now this is at 2, 1. Okay. The plus 3 moves everything up 3. So now we're at 2, 4. And the horizontal asymptote is at y equals 3. <clears throat> and the final graph looks like this. So as far as asymptote, the asymptote is y equals 3. Um, over here, by the way, I messed up. That was x. That should be x equals 2. It's a vertical line. So this one's horizontal. And then um, if you were to ask out the questions, I'd say it's increasing because it's going up. I would say it's concave up. So this is just good practice for all that huge table of 20 points that was on your test. Okay, 14, find the domain of, of this. Now, this is the same thing as that. This is a different way of writing a composite function. So I would write the composite function. So that's going to be the natural log is on the outside and the x squared minus 4x is on the inside. And so the domain is the inside has to be positive. So then we're going to factor. This is polynomial equality. Do it the way you did back in chapter one. Find the roots. Do a line check. Test the value. True, false, true. <clears throat> true, false, true. So the it's negative infinity to zero and four to positive infinity. Interval notation. Um, okay. Now, the thing on the test, you also are asked to like solve an inequality, which I think is coming up later on. On seventeen. Okay. Fifteen. Uh, if b is between zero and one, is this graph increasing or decreasing? Well, we could draw a sketch. Um. <clears throat> So it's an exponential, right? And goes to 0, 1, y equals 0. So that's the parent function of just b to the x. Um, <clears throat> if the base is between 0 and 1, what happens is, like say it's 1 half. Let's just do that as an example to help us wrap our head around this. If you do that, well, this is the same thing as 2 to the negative 1, right? Which gives you 2 to the negative x. So it's going to, the, the negative on the inside is going to flip it left to right. Right? The negative on the outside is going to flip it upside down. So... This is, this is what this graph looks like. This graph looks like this. It's an exponential flip left and flip down. The value of the base be, um, between 0 and 1 is the same as having a negative exponent on like a normal one. So <clears throat> is it increasing or decreasing? It is increasing. It is concave down if you wanted to just throw some other stuff in there. <clears throat> it has a horizontal asymptote of y equals 0. Okay, is the graph of its inverse concave up or down? So I'm going to just do another quick sketch here of what we finally got.
right? Now the inverse gets flipped across y equals x, right? So <clears throat> 0, negative 1 becomes negative 1, 0. y equals 0 becomes x equals 0. And the graph, uh, the graph that looked like this now looks like this. Okay, <clears throat> so is the graph of its inverse concave up or down? It is concave up. Concave up. I think of my solutions I put down on the ones that are online. But <clears throat> there you go. All right, 16. Solve these. Solve these problems. So these, you know, if you're solving log equations, usually you could rewrite it back in uh, exponential form. So 10 negative ones, one tenth. Uh, if it's in exponential, then you might use logs to undo it. So you do natural log on both sides. This allows you to bring it out in front, x minus two times natural log of e. Uh, natural log of one is zero. What do you raise e to to get one? What do you raise anything to to get one? Zero. And what do you raise e to to get e? One. So it's x minus two equals zero. So x equals two. Um, this one, let's see. I would rewrite it into exponential form. Four to the x equals uh, square root of eight is the same thing as 2q, or we could we could start with 8 to the 1 half. Then you'd want to make the bases the same. Because there's this, this way, this strategy of making the bases the same so that you can then just set the exponents equal to each other. Now, I don't think we really had any exactly like that on the test, but we did have them during. And it's just good if you understand how to work with exponentials and logs. Now this, this is something we had on the test, and this is a problem that a lot of people had a lot of trouble with. So, <clears throat> first of all, um, if you want to get rid of the log, you're going to exponentiate both sides with 4. It means you can kind of like raise both sides as x minus to 4. That would get rid of that, and then you get x plus 2 is less than or equal to 4 to the 0 is 1. Now, this is a problem that we could just solve, subtract 2 from both sides, you know, with without doing line checks. So you could do that, um, or you could do a line check, you know, uh, x uh, plus 1 is less than or equal to 0. The root is x equals negative 1. You do a line check. It's going to be a solid dot, negative 1. You're going to test a point. Make x equals zero, which is going to be false, true, and then we get the same result. But that's probably a little more like what the work you might actually have to do. But here's the other big thing. You also have to consider the domain separately. Separate line check. Do not combine it. The inside has to be positive. Now, again, this time it's so simple that we could just do it without a line check. But if we were to do a line check, we would say, okay, let's find the roots. Let's put them on a line open dot, negative two, no, and that was a solid dot. Okay, negative two, test a point, uh, x equals zero, true, false, same answer. Now, here's the deal. This has to be true because this is the answer to what you're being asked. This has to be true because that's just where the graph exists. So it's a, uh, it's a compound inequality, the intersection of two intervals. <clears throat> so, to me, a very easy, effective way is to graph them directly above and below each other because it's like the word is and, and figure out where they intersect. So negative 2 to negative 1, parenthesis on negative 2 because it doesn't belong to both, bracket on negative 1 because it does belong to both. But you have to consider domain also. Separately do the work. Two separate line checks. Some people are doing all of that on the same line check, and that doesn't work. Um... <clears throat> Okay, symmetry. Uh, so the way we do these is uh, 
I like you guys to set up a table to justify your answer. So plug an X in, get Y out. Um, I plug A and negative A in. So if I plug A in, I get uh, A to the fourth minus two absolute A, right? Um, can I get rid of these absolute values? No, because what if A is negative? So then we do negative A, negative A in parentheses. Now, negative A to the fourth is the same as A to the fourth because it's even power. It's going to make sure it's positive no matter what. And the absolute value of negative A is the same as the absolute value of A. They should both give the same answer, so I could rewrite that. So now I can compare these to each other, and because they are the same, that means the left half and the right half of this graph look just like each other, which is even symmetry, like a cosine function or parabola. <clears throat> All right, so if I plug A in here, I get negative four A squared over A squared plus five. Is there anything that's in five of this? No. And I do negative A, negative four times negative A in parentheses squared over negative A in parentheses squared plus five. That's gonna give you negative four A squared over A squared plus five. And that negative A squared is just A squared, right? Same thing there. So these are the same and therefore it is even. Um, 20. So we get a negative a cubed plus a over a cosine a. And we do negative a, negative, negative, negative a cubed. There's extra negative outside plus negative a over negative a cosine of negative a. Now, negative a cubed is going to give you a negative, right? Um, so that's going to give you negative a cubed, and there's very negative, so it's going to become positive a cubed. Not because the negatives right now cancel, but because this gives you negative a cubed, and there's another negative. After that, it's going to become positive. <clears throat> On the bottom, cosine negative a, because cosine is an even function, you can draw a picture of it. This is a cosine curve, right? So if you plug in negative a, you're going to get the same thing as positive a. So we could just say, oh, okay, well, that's the same thing as positive a. Now I'm trying to compare this to this. So what I could do is divide a negative out of everything on the top or bottom or multiply the top and bottom by a negative. And then I would get negative a cubed plus a over positive a cosine a. And that looks more like what we started with, which is equal, which is the same, which is even. So I didn't give any odds or neithers on here, but you could find some on the original test or pretest. But that's the kind of work I'm looking for. Inverse functions, just finding the inverse function um, means I usually think of the f as y first, and then I swap the x's and y's, because that's what happens on inverse functions. They undo each other. And then you want to solve for the new y. So it's a lot of messy algebra at this point, just trying to get the y by itself. So you multiply both sides by y minus 2, right? You got to distribute this. Now, a lot of people, I feel like, made a mistake there where they, they didn't distribute the x to the negative 2. They just had a minus 2 here. It's good to put parentheses and show your distribution. Now, we're trying to solve for the new y. So we want to get them all together on the same side and move all the other stuff to the other side. So I'm gonna add two X to the right, subtract Y over here, factor the Y out, because I'm trying to get it by itself. That's a trick from algebra one to solve for a variable that's stuck in multiple terms that are not like each other. And then we can divide both sides by X minus one. And so Y equals two X minus one over X minus one. So like that, uh, maybe you put the little negative one there, or you could write it like this, the way they originally told us, which I think would be the best to write it like this. You really should have like a Y or F over here though. You, could, you shouldn't just have that as your answer, you know, just this term. Um, so that's that. And then these graphs. So let's see. Um, I would maybe just sketch the original graph. 
first. It's the parent function. So we've got to work from the inside out. So the negative on the inside flips everything left to right. Everything left to right. So now this is over here. And this is over here. It's like just a mirror image left to right. Okay, it stops right there. And then the absolute values outside make everything positive. So it flips everything up. That wasn't up. So that's a graph now. And then the negative flips everything upside down. So the final graph <clears throat> looks like that. Okay, that's the final graph. Now this next one's a little tricky because it has a horizontal shift and we had a discussion about this. I think when we were, I messed it up, I think even on my original solutions um, and I, th or, yeah. And then I think I messed it up on you know, the pretest and stuff too. So here's the deal. We got to take care of the absolute values before the horizontal shift. So I'm going to sketch the original graph real quick. Okay. So the absolute values, what they do is they reflect the right half onto the left half and the left half just disappears because that's what it does. And then the, the minus one side sh shifts everything to the right one. So now it's like this. Okay. Now this is getting kind of hard to see. Okay. Now the absolute value on the outside makes everything positive. So these gets flipped up and then the negative flips everything upside down. So the final picture, it's just getting kind of busy here. Looks like that. That's the graph. So the thing you got to watch out for is you do the shift after any other things that affect it on the inside, <clears throat> things that affect the period, things that are multiplying the X on the inside, the absolute values, do those before the shift. Okay. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> That's it. Uh, obviously anything else on the original test is still fair game. So you should study your original test. You can go back and redo problems on the pretest, uh, review assignments. There's tons of problems. You can print out a clean blank version of any of those and just do problems that you know you need extra practice on. There's tons of problems out there. And the good thing about them is you have all the answers and work uh, to check them, which is important. So get ready for your retest.